So today, we're going to talk about what it means to follow Jesus and to follow Jesus as far as generosity. And we're going to center it on three specific questions. What do we expect from God? What wars against our trust? And what drives our abundance? But we're going to start by reading our scripture, which is out of the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. If you have your Bible, we're reading from the ESV, which is also a part of the app, but you can follow along wherever you have the scripture. It'll also be here on the screen. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to a wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to him, his mother said to his servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who drew the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. The word of God for the people of God and the people of God said... Thanks be to God. So I want to start with this heart of expectation, asking the question, what do you expect from God? What do you expect from God? I think expectations are everything. The image I had pop in my head as I was preparing today's sermon was the expectation of seeing a kid throwing a tantrum in a grocery store. I think for some of us, as we get uh, angry when we see kids losing their minds in the grocery store, but for the most part, we're able to recognize, well, it's a kid kind of being a kid, because we don't expect from a kid the behavior of an adult. In the same sense, if you flip that around, how many sometimes have seen adults who are acting like kids? And we get frustrated with that because the expectation is that they would be grown-ups about it. For example, if you went to Target and you saw a kid who wanted a toy and mom and dad said, no, you can't have that toy, and the kid starts throwing a fit, you maybe would think some thoughts about the parents, which is not really the right thing to do, but it's the natural broken part of who we are. But more than likely, you would see, man, that kid really wanted that toy. I understand that. My experience as a kid, my experience with my kids, whatever it is, I get the tantrum that's being thrown. If you walk down the aisle and you saw a grown man throwing a tantrum wallowing on the floor, you would feel a little bit different about it because your expectations shape the way the experience is being perceived. Let me give you another example. I, in my life with my son, want him to have high expectations of me. Expectations that his dad will do what he said he'll do and his dad will show up in hard times. Those are two major expectations that I'm placing on myself for my relationship with my son. I want my son to know as he grows up that, that I'm going to be there for him. That even when he makes mistakes, that I'm not going to be the one that distances myself, but I'm going to draw near to him. I say that because it comes from my personal experience. In 1987 or so, we lived on the south side of Oklahoma City. There was a tornado that was coming towards our house. It was over by Will Rogers. We thought we all needed to get in the bathtub because that's what you did before you had fancy storm shelters. You got in the bathtub and threw a mattress on yourself. Did anybody else have that experience? All right, anybody? Okay. We used to not all have storm shelters, but now we kind of all do. And so uh, we all were in the bathtub. We had our, my dad wasn't there. He was working late. He was at where he worked, and we were there. And so we were kind of panicking. I was five years old, freaking out. And all of a sudden, through the door, my dad opens it up, and he worked, in, uh, he worked at the Lisi and had a hard hat, and he had his hard hat on and a flash like a superhero coming through the door. I had an expectation for my dad, that my dad would be the one that would take care of us, that he would save us. Expectations shape our experience of everything. And I think about that in our relationship with God. This past week on midweek in scripture, we looked at the gospel of Luke. Two weeks ago, we looked at the gospel of Luke in chapter 11. And and God and Jesus helps us understand that expectations for him are okay. 
Chapter 11, verse 11. What father among you, Jesus is saying, if a son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So the first thing I want us to resonate with and connect with is what are our expectations for God? What do we expect from God? This passage that we read from the Gospel of John in the first 11 verses there talks about Mary's expectations for Jesus. There's something going on at this wedding. Jesus is there. Mary is there. There's probably a familial connection going on here. Even some of the disciples are there. And how do we know there's a family? Not just their connection to one another, but beyond that, what we know is in that is that Mary has a responsibility when the wine runs out. Mary has a responsibility to fix it. Because it would have been a tremendous embarrassment for your wedding party to run out of wine. It would have been a moment of shame. These wedding parties aren't like the receptions that often we're a part of or that we throw. These aren't just one night parties, maybe some refreshments, maybe some cookies, coarse cake. These are week-long celebrations. So they're gathered here together. An immense amount of shame would have been for the family that failed to provide for their guests. So Mary walks up to Jesus with an expectation that he would do something. Now I want to pause. I want to make sure we understand two parts of this. Because Jesus responds in what can be perceived as harsh. Woman, what does this have to do with me? I'm letting you know that if I talk to my mother that way, it would not probably end well. I know many of you would feel the same. But what I do know is that if you can understand a little bit more of the context and what's going on with Jesus, you can see this as more of a moment where Jesus is beginning to distance himself from simply being the son of Mary. The word woman is really one of the scholars that helped make it make sense to me says that it's more like the word ma'am for many of us. Ma'am, what does this have to do with us? And for us who are so integrated with our nuclear family, it's hard. But what we've seen numerous times in the Gospels is that Jesus is distancing himself from strictly just Mary and Joseph's son. And in this moment, that's what's happening. Is Jesus is saying to Mary like, hey, like I'm the Messiah My time has not yet come. So it's not harsh as much as distancing himself. And by that, Jesus is including more and more people as part of his family. But my favorite part about it is that Mary doesn't stop. If you were to play this story out, maybe in your own experience or your own mind, Jesus would say, woman, what do you, well, this is not my thing. It's not my time to do that. And for many of us, we'd be like, oh, you're right, Jesus, I'm so sorry, But that's not how Mary responds, right? Mary goes, hey, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. She doesn't pause. John doesn't have her stopping or rethinking her ways. She moves forward with the expectation that Jesus, both as the oldest son of her family and as this person whom, from the beginning of the story that we know in the Gospel of Luke, has been told that he would have powers, that he would be Jesus the Messiah, And so she moves on from the moment and says, servants, do whatever he tells you to do. I want to stop there. Because I think the very baseline of what we need to hear this morning is that word. Do whatever it is he tells you to do. I think if we're honest along our journey of faith, is sometimes we wrestle wrestle with what we believe. But I want you to hear today is when we just read those baptismal vows... And you said, I do. What was being said there is that you profess, once again, Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, if Jesus Christ is Lord over your life, the most basic thing that you're expected to do is whatever it is Jesus tells you to do. So at the core of following Jesus is doing whatever it is Jesus tells you to do. I think about it in the context of the two greatest sermons of, in the history of the world, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew and the Sermon on the Plain in the Gospel of Luke. And at the end of these uh, extravagant teachings about how we're supposed to live as members of the kingdom of heaven that's both here and to come, Jesus tells a story at the end. He says, listen, if you hear what I say 
and put it into practice, you're like the man who built his house on the rock, the firm and strong foundation, and when the winds and the waters and the storm came, the house withstood it. But if you listen to what I say and you walk away and you don't do it, you're like the man who built on the sand, and when all those things came, the house was destroyed. We have to stop pretending that following Jesus doesn't mean that we have to do the things that Jesus says we're supposed to do. So we have to live into this call that Jesus is living out here in John chapter 2, that Mary expects of Jesus to do something, and in response, she tells the servants to do whatever Jesus says for them to do. Mary came to Jesus with the expectation that he would do something, and here's the good news, is Jesus did do something. Jesus did do something. He grabbed these jars that were full of ritual cleaning water and he turned them not only to to two buck chuck, that reference made, that's okay. He turned them into the best wine that is normally reserved for the beginning. He served at the end. So you and me today, the first thing we need to do when we talk about generosity, when we walk through this series of scarcity versus abundance, we have to recognize that a heart of abundance, a life of abundance starts with a higher expectation that God will do what God says he does. We either believe it or we don't, church. Like that, that's the dynamic we have to walk through because what? You have so many other cool things that you could do on a Sunday. Maybe not a pandemic, but on normal Sundays. So you're here. You call yourself a follower of Jesus. As a Christian, do we believe that what God said, especially in the person of Jesus, is real or do we not? Because if we don't, and I'm not saying like doubt. Doubt is very normal. But I'm saying like let's either live it out or go to brunch. I don't want to either. So living out of an expectation, and here's one of the ways that's kind of manifested itself in me, is, is I'm trying to shift the way I pray. Shifting the way I pray in the sense of moving from um, this real passive uh, response to a, a heart of expectancy, interceding and in expectancy. And, and let me help this maybe make more sense. So there's been a lot of time when I've come to the Lord in prayer and I've, I've come real bashfully. Lord, if there's any way that you could look upon your poor servant, and maybe if you've got time, if it would fit in your will, if you think it would work, maybe not, but maybe, I don't know, Jesus, maybe if you could do something, that would be great. Instead, shifting my heart of expectancy and prayer, I'm coming to the altar and saying, God, you promised that you would pour out your spirit in a new way, that young and old will see dream, or have dreams and see visions You said it, I believe it, I'm expecting that you would do what you said you would. Take the passivity out of your prayer life and move forward with a heart of expectation that God would actually do what God says he would. And I think about that in the line of scarcity and abundance. Do we really believe that God will provide for us? Do we really believe that? The heart of that starts with an expectancy that God will do what he says he does. So the question is, is how do we increase our trust? That was one of the first conversations we started as we walked into this stewardship series. But I want to focus in on what wars against our trust. I'm going to apologize in advance. We're going to go long, period. But what wars against our trust? What was different between Mary and Jesus and often us and Jesus? I think the first thing is this is that Mary had a relationship with Jesus. Mary had a relationship with Jesus. She knew what Jesus would do because of the familial connection. We know what Jesus will do because of the relationship that we do or don't have. I've said this numerous times, and I'll say it again, is that we want the fruit without the investment in the relationship. Last week, Steve Trice came up here, and he talked about all these things, and I'm telling you, it's really easy for me to say, well, that doesn't relate to me at all because I'm not an owner of a business that's this big, and I don't have all of these different things, but here's what I want to tell you about Steve's story. The reason Steve could move forward in that is because he had a deep, abiding relationship with Jesus that was bred on relationally investing in that every single day. At four o'clock in the morning, Steve Trice gets up and starts his quiet time. He prays for an hour with you, for me. He's praying for you as a church, too. 
prays for my family. He prays for all of the 11 men that he's discipling. He prays for his company, his sons, his family. He prays for other people, situations in the world. Then he spends another hour in Scripture meditating and memorizing upon Scripture. He's memorized so many Scriptures over the course of his life that he won't even go back and start new ones because it's like I start forgetting my old ones if I start new ones. And so he just re-goes through all of these different Scriptures over the course of his life. Now, I don't say that to elevate Steve. I don't say that to say that Steve is a spiritual elite and all of you should try to, that's not the point. But the reason Steve could stand up here in confidence and proclaim what God did for him and his company is because he invested in the relationship. We come with a heart of expectancy, but we have to invest in our relationship with God. Mary knew who Jesus was better than anybody else. And so her relationship drew her trust out of her, that Jesus would do what he could do. So it's based in relationship. So if you want to see God do some amazing things for you, through you, I can't encourage you enough to invest in the relationship. And this is the final reminder about that, is any distance that exists between you and God is not on God. We create the distance. God is always near us. So how do you break down the distance by investing yourself in daily quiet times and reading your scripture and praying to God and trusting that God is in the midst of all of this? So what wars against our trust is the lack of relationship. The second thing that wars against our trust is fear. A heart of scarcity holds tight because we're afraid. We're afraid of what might happen if we don't have enough. We're afraid of what happens if we maybe release too much. Will I have enough for the things that I want to do? Fear wars against our trust. And here's what I want you to know that connects to the heart of our relationship. is what casts out fear. Perfect love. Well, where is perfect love? In Jesus. So your relationship as it builds toward Jesus begins to cast out that fear. We're not going to really develop a heart of trust for Jesus if we don't have the relationship. So what wars against our trust? A distance in our relationship that is dependent on ourselves, not on Christ nearness. And the second part is that fear, which is directly tethered to the heart of who God is for us. And the last question is this. What drives our abundance? What drives our abundance? Our abundance is founded in the abundance of God. We We don't live abundant and generous lives just as we materialize it from within. We live lives of generosity and lives of abundance because God is overwhelmingly abundant for you and me. Overwhelmingly. Philippians 2 is the passage that's been resonating in my spirit for a long time. And one of the things it says that sits at the center of it is is Paul saying to the church in Philippi, he says, listen, have this mind about yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped. But instead, he took the form of a servant, being found in the likeness of men, and being made in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. God recognized that we on our own could not make things right. And instead of sitting on the throne and letting us swirl the drain for eternity, he said, I'm going to jump in and make all things new. That's abundance, y'all. That's abundance. That's God's overwhelming, abundant grace for you and me. And then he looks at you and me and he says, I don't really care what you've done or what you will do. My love is still for you. That's abundance. That's generosity. So what fuels your generosity is God's generosity. What if God held back his abundance the way we do? What if God held back his generosity in the way we do? Let me give you an example of this. Often in the church, one of the things we hear is not only please don't talk about money, but I don't want to give money to the church because I don't really trust what the church is going to do with it. I don't know. I really, if I could invest it here, I know where it's going to go exactly. And I know that, man. Like, that's a millennial, like, it's like a millennial tagline. I'm a millennial. It's a millennial tagline. Like, I want to give it to this person because I know where that money goes. And here's, I had this epiphany this morning. Thank God that he doesn't dole out his grace that way. 
Thank God that he doesn't say, I'm only going to be generous with my love to those who use it in the right way. Thank God that his grace is ridiculously generous. So what drives our abundance? The love of God. God's abundance drives our abundance. And I've said this from the beginning, is your generosity is your ability to participate in the story of God. That literal lives can be changed by you living a life of abundance. And let me just, like I said, we're going to go a minute over, two minutes. How have you been shaped by the generosity of others? How have you been shaped by the generosity of others? Tonight at uh, 6 p.m., I'm going to kneel at an altar, and the bishop of of the Oklahoma Annual Conference is going to lay his hands on me and tell me to take this power and authority. It's 2020. In 1998, I'm a member of a youth ministry, Grace United Methodist Church. And somebody says, we want to pay for you to go to Chrysalis. Okay. I went to Chrysalis. I was very confused by the whole experience. Still wasn't really in on this thing. Hey, somebody wants to pay for you to go to disciple camp. Okay. I go to disciple camp and God changes everything. In 2008, I get a phone call from my friend John Gilstrap. says, hey, we'd love to bring you on full time at our church. What is that going to take? Well, the generosity of others paid for me to step into vocational ministry. 2014, I started here in 2012, 2014, I start the process of moving through ordination. Well, how do I go to seminary? The generosity of others. Bill Junk comes up to me and says, listen, if you want to go to seminary, we'll find a way to pay for it, for the foundation. Men and women invested in a fund at the Oklahoma United Methodist Foundation that says, hey, we want young men and women to be able to go to seminary and not come out with a burden of student loans generosity of others pushed me in the seminary the generosity of others lets me work here the generosity of others lets this night tonight that's happening is going to happen the generosity of others is the reason we do everything church so if your life has been touched by the work of the church you're the fruit of generosity if your life has been touched by the fruit of anybody's generosity then what makes us think that we have the right to hold back when so many others have lived abundantly so that we could find new life and new things and new experiences? My whole entire life is the fruit of others' generosity. What a hypocrite I would be if I didn't live generously in my own life. So what has other people's generosity done for you? How have you been shaped by others' generosity? And I know that there are some of you who be like, never. I did everything on my own. But I would bet that's not true. I would bet that's not true. Living in abundance allows us the space to participate in God's story. And and I know there's a whole bunch of weird parts of this where we feel this tension of like the the prosperity gospel. It's like, well, if you give, God's going to give back to you, double over, turned in a bucket and swirled and thrown at you, right? Like... (laughs) <laughs> there's a passage that's roughly that. <laughs> and I know it's dangerous, right? Because we're like, if you just had more faith, if you just trusted God a little bit more, maybe God would provide. And I understand that feels icky for some of you. But what I want you to know is, is if, you pull, if you boil all of that down and you take all of that side stuff that makes you feel uncomfortable away, you can't avoid the call of the Gospels to be generous. You can't. And that's going to look different for each one of you. We just did this. It's perfect that we did membership today. It's almost like somebody planned it. And uh, at the end of it, we asked people, do they support the ministries of New Covenant with their prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? That's five, five arms of generosity. Prayers. Are you generous in your prayers? Presence. It's a weird one in COVID. <laughs> but are you generous with your presence? Gifts, are you generous with your gifts? Are you generous with your service? Are you generous with your witness? Here's what I know. This is my final sermon. This is going to pass. 
And, and I know that I, I join all of you in longing for the day when this weird season passes and we throw uh, all the masks on the altar and we set them on fire, right? This will <laughs> Thank you. This will pass. And here's what I know in the depth of my soul is that as soon as we get our feet back underneath us, and we figure out how many people, you know, have moved on to other churches, how many people love the church of sitting on the couch more than showing up to these beautiful, comfortable pews. As soon as we figure out what this church is all about in March or April or May or June, that God has been saying to me, and, and the only reason I trust in this is not just because of this prayer relational journey, but because it's been affirmed in so many others who are praying the same thing is that God has some big dreams ahead of us. Is that 2021 is going to be weird, but not as weird as 2020? Is that God is saying to you and me that your church, I'm going to do something incredible there. And we're going to see young and old come to know Jesus. We're going to see young and old who come in hurting, finding wholeness in Jesus. We're going to see the Holy Spirit descend in a way to where we're going to leave church and be like, I don't know what happened, but I feel like I'm floating back to my car. That we're going to see God do something magnificent in our time. And I believe that in every fiber of my being. And here's what I want to ask you to do. As I want you today to commit with your card that you're in. I don't care if you've never given before. I shouldn't say these things. I don't care if you've never given before and you commit that you're going to give like 50 bucks this year. Because what's more important is not the numbers that are on these things. I mean, that matters, trust me. (laughs) But what really matters is that you're committing that you're going to live generously this year and that you're in for what God has in store for New Covenant in 2021. Open hands, man. Nathan, I told you you can't start doing that stuff, man. You're going to get me emotional and start screaming. Like, it's open hands, people. God, and, and just trusting that no matter what we put on these cards, that God is able to do infinitely more. Infinitely more. I'm telling you, there's an awakening on the horizon. And the city of Edmond... In the city of Oklahoma City, and Deer Creek, and Piedmont, and Luther, and Jones, and Guthrie, that there are going to be people that don't know what's going on, but they're like, man, Jesus is doing something in my life. And you get to participate in that. So let's say yes today. Let's say yes today. Will you pray with me and Stephen and Nathan if you want to, whatever you want to do. God, um, first off, I confess, God, like, I know this is my heart, like, uh, I'm scared about literally everything, <laughs> but, but at the heart of my fear, um, sometimes it's this, like, heart of not having enough, and I confess that to you, and I lay that at your feet, and I say, this just, like, so contrary to your story. Because your story is speaking over the heart of everybody in this here is that you're enough. I want you to hear that church this morning. God is saying to you that he's enough. He's enough. He's enough. He's enough. We don't know what the future looks like, God, but we know you're in it. And if you're in it, I fear nothing. Increase my faith. Banish fear in the name of Jesus today, Lord. Let us live open-handed that this city, this world will be transformed by a church set on fire for generosity. Every single person, God, that that came before us and every single person that will join after us, we're all moving towards you, Lord. So guide and direct us. You can have it all, God, every part today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.